Hey everybody, welcome to the Real Tuners Podcast. We're a little dumbed down today due to some technical difficulties, <laughs> but we are working and uh, we're going to have a good night and do a tech discussion for you. All right. All right, thank you, Scott. So uh, this is Bill Fowler. I'll be acting as a little bit of master of ceremonies this evening. We've got uh, some of our usual hosts online, Mark Dahlquist with Throttles Performance. Uh, Scott Evans uh, dialing in from uh, beautiful downtown Las Vegas. Uh, I apologize for a little bit of noise on my end. I'm calling you from the lovely Phoenix Airport, which I'll be in a quieter moment here just uh in just a couple of minutes. The great news tonight is that we have Earl Schexenator uh, online. Earl is a multiple drag league competitor, multiple racing competitor, uh, and uh, all around transmission expert. So one of the things we want to do right out of the gate tonight is start talking about uh, your transmission questions, uh, things that you've always wanted to know but have been afraid to ask about all different kinds of transmissions, torque converters, uh, power management through transmissions. So with that, Earl, would you be willing to uh, introduce yourself a little bit to everyone listening to Real Tuners Podcast tonight? Yeah, I'm from uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. <clears throat> I have Shex Nader Racing. We specialize in six, seven, eight second, nine second, whatever um, street cars. And I know everybody wants to know a lot about the 10 speed and eight speed transmissions, but we have not messed with any of those yet. Six R80 stuff, a lot of that stuff, six L80, six L90. Uh, mostly for drag week stuff, it's going to be power glide <clears throat> and turbo 400 stuff. Um, that's the seems to be in four L80 seems to be pretty reasonable, but the most durable one would be the 400 and the power glide. What kind of questions? So, Earl, you mentioned uh, for Drag Week uh, about the 400 and the Power Glide. And a question that comes up a lot is, you know, for someone who's looking to make that choice between a Glide and a 400-based transmission, how do you recommend people look at making that kind of choice? What's, what's, what are the determining factors as to whether it's better to go Glide or 400? Well, mostly it's weight. Weight and type of... Uh, power adder like turbo blower nitrous stuff like that light car you definitely want to go power glide heavy car big tire and three speed it'll, it'll definitely help you but it just depends on how much power you're making how much weight you're dragging and how much durability you're looking for so when you talk about that weight, is there kind of a shorthand that you would use? Is it like 3,000 pounds or 3,200 pounds? Obviously, that varies a bit based on, as you mentioned, the power adders. But is there kind of a, a point at which people need to start thinking both ways and then go through the further discussion? Yeah, I mean, anything more than like 3,400 pounds, I would definitely go three-speed. Um and if you got a small cubic inch motor, you'd probably want to stay three three speed to keep it in the power range. Power glide is your most durable transmission you're going to find, or you have no issues with it. You can run drag week, whatever drag month, and never have any problem. The power glide is just a bulletproof transmission. The 400, it's a, it's a real nice piece, but it has more moving parts, more stuff to break. So it's still a it's kind of a toss up. I like the 400, but it just has, it's not as durable as the power glide. So traditionally guys built transmissions based on factory cases, but now we've got aftermarket cases, like yeah. the Reed case, for example. Um, what's your opinion on, on where guys should start considering, you know, spending the extra money? Cause they're not a cheap date uh, to go to that uh, power glide case uh, or the 400 case or now uh, the 4L80 aftermarket cases i love the aftermarket cases anything over a thousand horsepower should have an aftermarket case because you only got one set of feet and pe people don't want to put transmission shields and blankets and stuff in these cars and i see it all the time they're running a 400 stock case and it blows everything through the floorboard of the car so and when somebody's gonna lose a leg or a foot it's gonna really hit home you know 
yeah, we had, we had I've, a good, I've actually go ahead, Scott. I was gonna say we had a, a good buddy of ours down there when I was working down there with Earl that was uh, he built a car for somebody. The guy didn't want to put in a, a case or a shield. He just wanted yep. him to race with the stock 4L80 transmission. And uh, he let off the, the trans brake and it launched and it blew up. And it, he he told us that uh, he thought he lost his foot because his shoe came off and hit him in the in the face. And uh, he was for certain that his foot was still in there. He got lucky. Yep. He broke his ankle and mangled him up a little bit. Got real lucky. Yeah, he could pass his helmet through the floor, through the hole in the floorboard. Yeah, and we've discussed right we've discussed safety before on real tuners. Um, how everyone wants to do the minimum safety required for some reason, and this is just one more example of of just try and be safe because you can get hurt, you know, without without even realizing you'd be hurt. And it's just bad. Well, everybody takes it for granted, and they just stick the transmission and never, never give it another second choice or thought, and then they really think about it when something comes through the floor. So, Earl, we've got a guy, uh, James McEwen. I, I hope mm-hmm. I pronounced that right. Uh, he says hello all from the AT two hundred seven dash eleven automatic transmission class. They've got fourteen students listening in live as they are building and assembling transmissions in Lincoln Tech in Grand Prairie, Texas. So okay. we might have we might have some students uh, building transmissions asking you questions here. Okay. Boy, that's awesome, guys! Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. It, it's an honor to have a whole classroom full of folks, and uh, thanks to your instructor for uh, putting you guys online to hear all of this. So, um, yeah, I think we've all had experiences, at least seen people have negative experience with trainees blowing up. Um, so, Earl, getting a little. F- further into this, some of the big power cars now are running 400s, uh, two-speed 400s. Um, yep. And help us, help our audience understand a little bit why the decisions are made to go to a two-speed 400 versus a glide. And kind of, again, you know, where do you start making those kind of decisions? Well, a two-speed 400, it's kind of a waste. I mean, you get a, you can use a 148 first gear, whereas in a power glide, you can get a 158 first gear in it and you'd be a lot cheaper going with the power glide than than trying to do a two-speed 400 it, it just to me i don't see the logic in it but all the 400s we do i have one right now a two-speed i gotta rebuild but the three speeds are heavy cars big power and something that you want to run multiple classes like small tire and big tire i can run the three speed and use first gear with big tires and use the two st- leave in second gear for small tires. What I haven't changed the gear ratio and stuff, so it makes it more versatile. But you can get away with it way easier with a power glide than a, a turbo four hundred, you know, two speed. That's a very handy kind of change to be able to make. Uh, so along with that, um, pe- one of the other things that people always struggle with is the starting point on a converter. Now, obviously they want to work with their transmission manufacturer or maybe yep. a particular uh, converter builder. What advice do you give to people who are trying to s- you know, figure out what's a good starting point based on a particular combination? Like let's say uh, you're doing the deal with a uh, turbo, single turbo LS and you're going to make uh, let's say 800 wheel or something like that. How, how do people start to look at that? What? Well, it's all about experience and with you, what you've been using. I mean, even for Scott, he had a turbo, twin turbo LS. We picked him out a converter. That's something that we used over years and years and years, and it's just been improving and improving every year. And we stuck it in his car, and he went eight O's with it, you know. And it's just one of those converters that really, really works, and BT makes it for me. And we use it in a bunch of different configurations, but we change it up. Sometimes they need a little bit more stall, a little bit less stall, but you got to have some, a baseline to start with. And hey, a Scott, power Evans. Scott Evans, yeah. check yes. the messages. Uh, I don't even know if I can see the messages. Um, keep going, Earl. Well, you got to start with one converter manufacturer, whatever you're going to use. If you're going to use a Neo Chance or a Pro Torque or a PTC, 
you stick with them and give them all the information you can. And for them to get it right on the first time is very unlikely. I mean, usually you have to send it back a couple of times. It's hard to tell people that, but m most of these guys think they can just buy a converter and first shot to put in there is going to be perfect. It, you can if you ran that same combination before. So typically in your experience, um, so you, you, you get the converter, you've given them all the information, you get as close as you can. For a guy to dial in a car, what's the reasonable expectation of the number of times that thing is going to come in and out to, to get it close, assuming you're able to go to the same track and repeat some of the other elements? Because obviously if you're going to different places and different conditions and different tracks and different tires, that all throws that out the window. But exactly. what's, what's, the, what's the best way to get, you know, that kind of situation dialed well, you, in? You, you have to have good data. You have to have a data logger or a good EFI system that can data log every run where you can compare everything. You need to see how much shift extension you have, how much it dra drags the converter, the motor back down on, on shifts. So if you're just relying on somebody to tell you what the tech's doing, you'll never figure it out. You've got to have real data that you can go back and look at. I think all of us that have used data loggers or doing EFI with data loggers, the first thing we find out is the uh, throttle position sensor uh, <laughs> yeah. truth machine. It's like, exactly. I didn't lift. Uh, well, yeah, you did. <laughs> that sort of thing. So that that's part of that process. Uh, you mentioned Neil Chance and PTC and some of the other great builders out there, Pro Torque. Uh, similar kind of question, you know, pe everybody has seen the bolt together converters uh, and yet obviously those are a great deal of money. When do you suggest yeah. people consider bolt together versus, you know, a conventional converter that has to be cut apart to be, uh, make changes? Well, once you get, once you have a combination figured out, then you can get your bolt together. The bolt together is to make small adjustments and if, if you're going to race a lot, you will have to take this thing apart every so many months and look in it because you'll catch a bearing going bad or something. If you catch it, a, a fin cracking or something, you can catch it before it destroys the whole converter. So you can send it back, get it for repaired. But if it's just a bearing or you want to clean it, you can do it yourself and saves a bunch of money. If you ship the converter back, it's 200 bucks to ship it overnight or something. So if you got to ship it overnight to Neil Chance and get it back again, you're gonna spend four five hundred dollars in shipping. You're way better off just buying you a good converter that you can do it yourself. So that raises an interesting point. So for guys that are looking at that do-it-yourself thing, um, how do you how do you manage a, a converter and a transmission program like that for folks? It, might not be as sophisticated yet to be able to make those decisions. What do you suggest or how do you like to manage that for your customers? Well, we usually go to the track with them, look at the data, and then we'll, we'll if we can change a stator and change RPM, a couple of hundred RPM here or there, a pump or something, and I'll deal with Marty or Joe or anybody, you know, whoever we get the converting stuff from. We usually have two or three stators for each converter. So we can change stuff back and forth. And you got to have some kind of way to experiment with it. You know, you can't, there's not, there's not, it's not written on the wall that says, I need this pump, this stator, and this turbo, whatever, and stick it in there is going to work. It's all going to work, but will it be perfect for your combination? No. So something else that what we're talking about, obviously kind of, you know, implicates is that you need to be able to get the transmission in and out of the car. You know, fairly yeah, easy, turbo fairly car. quickly turbo cars are pretty easy because you have no exhaust back there you know so transmissions r and r is pretty simple you a lot of these guys do it at the track what do you do about uh, cooler and cooler lines and that sort of thing i run the biggest cooler we can put and we use like the um it's a 40 pass cooler with the fan built on from um oh, i can't think of the name name of the rail right now. It's the, the rail, the, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a 40 rail. pass cooler. It's a it made a big difference in all our vehicles we've tried it on. Scott, can you repeat that brand name again for everybody? Derail. Derail. D-E-R-A-L-E. Derail. Yeah. 
Yeah. So a, a few minutes ago, we were talking a little bit about uh, torque converter maintenance and being able to open it up and take a look to see if a you know a fin is cracked or a bearing is going bad. Um, what do you suggest people do uh, as an ongoing thing to make sure their transmission, nothing is going wrong with it? What, what should, after every event, what, what should they kind of go through with a checklist to make sure everything is healthy and working properly? Every event, if we run them real hard, I change the fluid in every, in every one of them. Drop the pan. If there's anything going on, you'll see it. I mean, if there's brass in the pan, if there's plastic in the pan, which shouldn't be much plastic in a race transmission. But brass, aluminum. Aluminum is usually from like aluminum stator or something, the converter. Sprag tearing up something. And you'll find a little bearing material and stuff like that. You want to catch it before it turns into a major ordeal. And fluid is cheap. Change the fluid every race. You go out there and make three or four qualifying runs, three or four rounds. That's seven, eight passes. Change the fluid, especially at, on a turbo car. At possibly 200, 250 degrees sometimes. So it's, Yeah, 300 degrees, easy. Yeah, and the converter's hotter than that. Oh, yeah. Converter will get four, 500 degrees real fast. So we have our first question from the uh, – from James McCone's, McEwen's class. Uh, question from the student from a student class. 3,400 pound 2002 Camaro nitrous car, 650 horse, uh, turbo 400 built or a 4L80 built for daily driver with rear gear accordingly. Which would you prefer? Daily driver, I'd go with the 4L80. I mean, I'm assuming he wants to drive this thing on the highway. He didn't want, he's not going to, it's going to suck driving 45, 50 mile an hour in the interstate. What about a 400 with a uh, gear vendors? Well, that's the way to go. 400 with a gear vendor, that's what I have in my car. I mean, they got plenty of, plenty of guys going sixes at 200 miles an hour with that. So that raises an interesting sort of question. There's been a lot of debate about power consumption of transmissions, particularly a 400 uh, versus a 4L80. What is your experience? And uh, Does a 4L80 intake in fact take a lot more power to turn than a 400 it takes a little it has a little bit more rotating weight but not a lot of drag we've changed from 480 to 400 and really never noticed anything in, in in a typical nine second car you know so the the thing is with the 480 nobody made a, a better a good enough input sprag in the overdrive section to handle the power like a 400 does so they are strong. I mean, they got plenty of people running low eights, high sevens with 4080s in a relatively heavy car, 33, 3400 pound car. So they work great. It just, they will break more than a 400. And the heavier you get with the car, the easier they break. So some of these guys, you know, yeah. 4,000 pounds, all the new cars start out around 4,000 pounds. You know, new Camaro has like seven exactly. layers of floor. So it's super heavy. So Daniel Daniel Brummett wants to know if there's any downfall to running twin coolers instead of a single. No, you can never get the fluid too cool. I promise you. And then uh, Tony Gagne wants to know what kind of fluid do you prefer? Is there a brand or a or a type of fluid that you like over one over the other? Well, if you got a typical turbo car that you're going to run a lot and change the fluid a lot, I just use a typical. You can get a parts house Dextron six. Because you, you could change it in every weekend, so it's not a big thing. If you have something that you can run a lot and not change it, just maintenance and, and inspect it, that lat racing oil is a really, really good stuff. I mean, I don't know if whom, how many people have heard of it, but yeah, I use it in my car. That it, yep. It's a phenomenal oil, and the transmission, everyone I've taken apart, the transmission still looks brand new after you know half a season of racing. So I'll ask the tricky question. Have you had experience with some of the synthetics that are sold by a variety of the manufacturers? Any opinion on those? Well, I, I got a lot of guys that run raw, purple, red line, stuff like that. But that stuff is so expensive, you're not going to want to change it every weekend. They just Unless typically really run it until they have a transmission problem. So you so, mentioned the Dextron. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, just uh, Matt Aruda wanted to know tractor fluid versus ATF. And he's talking about like a pure hydraulic fluid versus ATF with the friction modifiers. I mean, tractor hydraulic fluid is great for tightening up loose converters, but it didn't have the lubricating properties of ATF. So 
it's still not a great thing. I mean, you, we we mix them. We'll go like half and half or some. Some people run it pure, but then when they wonder why all the needle bearings and and bushings are wiped out in the transmission, that's why. So, so that sounds like a no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's great for if in a crutch if you're trying to tighten up a converter, but it's just a crutch. And some guys are saying high guard, which is I think the the uh, John Deere and and uh, the Caterpillar yeah. Tra- label tractor oil. Yeah, we've used it all. I mean, we've used it all. That lat fluid is about the baddest stuff I've ever seen. I'm not gonna lie, it yeah. is phenomenal. And when you drain it, it still looks clean beautiful you know LA, lat is uh, lubrication advanced technologies and they use some pretty wild uh, engine oil too the, the question yep, they is have great engine oil transmission oil gear oil the question is if you're going to change we, it every race is it expensive nope. yeah you don't want to pay twenty dollars a quart <laughs> if you're changing <laughs> right. it every race exactly right. that, i'll run the make cheapest sure people understand synthetic oil is... you can get at walmart and change it every weekend So along those lines, uh, any preferences? The traditional Power Glide runs a screen. Uh, lots of choices when you're in a 400 or other transmissions. Do you have a preference around what you do with the, the filter in the transmission? 400s, we, we always use a screen screen style filter. Don't use a, a, a tradi- traditional like a paper filter. It doesn't flow enough oil. And so therefore, that does that apply to pretty much any transmission? Pretty, I mean, you kind of limit it when you get to uh, like 4080s, 4060s, unless you custom make your own filter for it, you know. So speaking of which, um, you know, we've covered uh, coolers a little bit. We've covered, uh, you know, filters, the, the fluid recommendations, those items. Uh, anything else that people really need to be thinking about well, to, to keep the transmission alive? Never throw it in neutral and like through the traps. A lot of people I've seen this years and I've done it years and years ago, run through the traps and shove it in neutral and shut the engine down. Well, you're looking for an explosion because you're going to overspeed the drums in this thing and blow them through the floor. Unless it has a clean neutral valve. Unless it has a clean neutral valve body, like a turbo 400. My car has, it has a clean neutral. Once you go first, second and third, you can pull it all the way down the next notch and it's clean neutral. Can you explain that just a little bit so people understand what the difference between a regular neutral and a clean neutral is? Well, it's keeping the clutch pack engaged to where it's not just going to take the high gear drum and, and what happens, it overspins the high gear drum so bad that it just makes it explode. So this clean neutral, it lets the engine slow down, but it kind of keeps all the transmission engaged. So in other words, that is how a 400 the power path in a 400 operates what about a glide you still don't want to put it in neutral because <laughs> you start over you over start over spinning the high gear drum just in neutral just, just think of it this way when you throw it into neutral suddenly it's spinning the drum twice as fast as it used to be spinning so if you were at 8,000 rpm now all of a sudden that drum is at 16,000 rpm yeah not a good thing Something and, and, I'd like to add to from a safety standpoint is uh, my experience is a lot of people like to use push lock hose with their transmission cooler oh, lines. Oh, big no. And that's a big no no. Big um, no no. I prefer the Teflon lines for transmission cooler because they take the temperature, they take any kind of pressure, uh, they um, uh, have better flow. There's there's uh, less internal yeah. resistance in a Teflon tube. Um, yep. Just use use a Teflon line braided hose. If you're using a flex hose, use the, use the Teflon line hose. It's a safety item. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people, and I did it too. I was guilty. I got I got the black braided hose, and on a turbo car, it's a big no no. It will melt off in a second. Yeah, you get a trans really hot. That stuff just melts right through. And I've seen the push lock stuff actually push off of a push right off of the barb. Yeah. Um, yeah. After, you know, after it gets enough passes on it, it'll just push right off. And uh, when you oil down the top end, uh, you know, under a pair of 14 inch wide slicks, that's not good. 
No, no, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> Pretty much always recommend AN fittings or PTFE fittings, something that has a secure locking threaded end to make sure it does not come off the transmission or the cooler. And like burnouts on a Turbo 400, if you have a burn, you do burnouts, when you get in the water, you want to start your burnout in second gear. Go from second to third and just kind of power out of it. But if you if you go from first to second, you you bang the sprag so bad in, on the animated sprag that it won't take many burnouts and it'll be broke. So start off in second, shift to third. You're not killing the transmission like that. Are there any similar things you'd recommend with other popular transmissions? We spend a lot of time on turbo four hundreds and power glides, but uh, what about some of the other four L eighty? Exactly the same thing. Yeah, four L eighty. You want to do it the same thing. Start off in second and shift the drive, and just kind of power out your burnout, and just don't let the tire just stop instantly. You know. How about some. So uh, what about some AOD of the stuff? Ford transmissions or the Chryslers? Chryslers, they'll make a big hole in the floor quick if if the low reverse sprag goes out in them, especially like neutral them and, and high gear like at the end of the traps and doing burnouts. Any transmission, really, if you just try to, if you just overspend it in, in the water in first, second, and third, it's not good. If you do it from second to third, you have a whole lot less rotating mass going opposite directions because you got a drum that's spinning 7,000 RPMs in first gear. When you shift it to second, it's got a dead stop and go the opposite way. So that's not good on anything. No, that, that makes complete sense. Um, I'd like to ask a quick follow-up question on that hose piece. When we mentioned the black hose, we're talking the, the sort of nylon lightweight hose. Are the Yeah, the lightweight nylon hose. It, it's no steel braid in it whatsoever. It was just nylon hose and with rubber. And this stuff melted off in, so fast it wasn't funny. That's that's a great to know. Are the are the Kevlar type hoses or the the ones that may be black on the outside but have the the steel mesh in them? Those are okay. Yeah, as long as it has steel mesh in it, it'll keep it from. What happened? I, I tried that. I thought it was all the same stuff, so I plumbed it all up in this nice black braided hose, and we 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 just spooling it up in the stage lanes, checking a few things, and next thing you know, the whole thing's on fire because the lines just melted off and fell on the ground. And this was from the heat of the fluid, or was this from being near the turbo plumbing? No, it is just from the heat from the fluid. So, so when you're talking about a turbo car, Earl, uh, do you have uh, any uh, type of uh, strategy with your converter dump valve, or have you run converter dump valves before? I haven't run. I'm fixing to start experimenting. I have a 400 we're, we're putting dump valves on right now, and we're going to start experimenting with it. But the stuff I've seen lately, if they, if they dump too much out of the converter, it overheats the converter. And then when you dump it back in there, it's kind of a shock to it. Sometimes it starts cracking fins and stuff. So you, it is a happy medium there. You don't want to dump too much out of it. So we've been talking about uh, temperature and the idea that you can never have the temperature too cool. Uh, where no. do you like to measure the temperature in the trans just to know what's going on? I measured in, in, in the pan. Some, yep. Okay. Uh, some people talk about uh, you know measuring other things, and in these days and age of uh, you know CAN buses and the ability to have a lot of sensors, uh, do you like to data log uh, line pressure, or are there other things that you can measure if if the if yeah we, we monitor it? line pressure and we monitor coolant. I mean, uh, oh. Um, no, the transmission cooler line pressure, and we uh, and we check it against line pressure too. If you, you man, if you might, yeah, thank you. If, a if you monitor line that. pressure on a car that launches real, real hard, you'll find a problem. If 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 you like, you have a problem with uncovering the filter on the launch, line pressure will start falling off on the launch and then come back up. So then you can fab you up like a baffle or something in the pan, or a filter that can catch further to the back of the pan that will you, you'll prevent transmission damage for sure so that raises an interesting question about fluid levels what's your approach to getting the the right fluid level in, in any particular transmission most of them are quarter inch above the pan rail but some of these high revving deals you might have to add an extra quarter all just to keep it happy 
like it, we always monitoring like line pressure. Well, on the launch, if it goes like 110, 112, 60 foot, and you see a line pressure goes from 220 down to 175, you know it's start for off for a split second. So we'll we'll put another quarter all in and see if that takes care of it. If that doesn't take care of it, you have to make a baffle system inside the pan to keep the all keep it happy. So we have uh, uh, touching on the uh, burnout sequence. Uh, Mark Schlotman wants to know how would you make that work with an auto shift valve body, even with a shifter in second, he starts in first, and all you can do there is 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 take it easy on it until it gets exactly. into high gear, and then and then and then let it eat. Yeah, just take it real easy. And once you get into second gear, then you can hammer on it. You know. Yeah, just just do it not quite rolling into it hard just kind of keep it like a part throttle till the tires are up fast enough for it to shift and then kenny howard wants to know at what power level or rpm would you consider it a requirement to switch to aluminum drums and hardened shafts anything over 650 700 horsepower flywheel horsepower it's time to start getting better drums and shafts for sure yeah and i don't know if we can answer Camaro Mike's question. He's having a problem with his 2017 Camaro SS. The torque converter clutch solenoid is stuttering at low pawpaw speed in traffic. Easy push on gas pedal at 40 to 90. It shakes. The dealer says they will have a new fluid in January to fix the problem. He also said the trucks have a bad. I I'm, I don't think that that's really anything we can do anything about if, if GM is releasing an updated fluid. Exactly. Yeah. You might be able to push where it locks up at to a different speed and take care of that, but GM probably doesn't want to change their transmission tuning because that's what makes it live as long as it does in a factory stock vehicle. So, Well, also then they'd tuning, have to recertify with the EPA, right. and they'd have to recertify the, the, uh, the advertised fuel economy as well. Right. So while GM solution is fluid you potentially might be able to raise where it locks up and it may be happier yeah but what transmission was that again you want well that's a 2017 camaro so that's going to be oh. the eight yeah. speed isn't it yeah it'd be the 8l90 yeah I, I didn't catch what uh vehicle it was in uh there's some torque converter settings in the tune you can actually manipulate also that will you know apply that a little better as well but but that's yeah. actually that's got more gears in it than a ford modular has timing chains <laughs> <laughs> yep oh now now you know the good news is with the 10 speed transmissions i'm hopeful that we can get away from all of this brand this and brand that because you know very soon here everybody's going to have the 10 speed and it's pretty much all the same from what i understand so i had a, I had a 10 speed once it was a schwinn <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I knew that hey, was coming. I wonder somehow. how Thank much you, time is involved hey, in all that shifting. Harold, hey, uh, do you have any mm -hmm. tips or tricks for a six L eighty? Uh, uh, getting a six L eighty to to work right. Man, six L eighty is very very critical on the tuning. Um, that's the biggest problem with them is people get in there and they start changing all kind of stuff, and they don't know what they're changing. And they also have and to do a that relearn that they don't know about. <laughs> The way. Maybe maybe there's James big, Short can expand on that. Yeah, there's a big relearn that you have to do when you change stuff too. If you if you do too much, mm. that will make it live longer. And most people don't know about that. They just oh yeah, I'm going to change this setting. And it'll be better, and it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually walking through Walmart Christmas shopping right now, but uh, I'll uh, I'll comment a little bit on that. Uh, the biggest thing is the torque values from the engine side of the tune. You know, if if the torque values that are delivered are completely off, it's going to throw everything off on the transmission side because all your line pressures, your shift timing, uh, clutch application, and deactivation is all based on the torque value delivered from the engine. So, you know, whenever people go in and start scaling tunes and uh, it jacks all that, you know, background torque calculation up, which really throws off the shifting on those transmissions. Mm, yep, that makes sense. So coming into the show tonight, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, we're going to focus mostly on kind of the, the drag week transmissions. More and more guys are doing stuff with the new ones. And we just, you know, had the 6L80 conversation. Are you seeing much in the way of people trying to run anything newer than like a 4L80 or God help them, a 4L60? 4L60? No, I work on those daily. 
Um, wouldn't the Tim drag day with those? I love that. <laughs> and so you're working on them daily to keep them alive. I, I, I'm just funning. Yeah. Oh, I get at least two or three dropped off every week. They're a great transmission for everyday transportation, but they're not great for hot rods. I thought the competition with the 4L60 was to see how many neutrals you could have. Oh, yeah. They got it hands down. I bought a bone stock truck that had four neutrals in it, or five neutrals in <laughs> yeah. it, actually. Hey, I'll say this. My wife's 2004 Tahoe has 222,000 miles on it. It's the original 4L60. Oh, I, I've seen it. Robbie, his I think it's got to be a world record, isn't it? Well, my God, it works for me. He had 280,000 280, on the original 4L60. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah, I mean, every time we'd, we'd ride in this thing, I was waiting to start walking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got to bring yeah. your walking shoes every time you get in that truck or car. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> We, we talked a little bit about uh, gear vendors. You have any uh, tips or tricks for people? You know, everybody talks about gear vendors being unbreakable. I, unfortunately, from personal experience, can tell you it is possible to hurt them by doing dumb things. Uh, oh, any yeah. advice for people about making their gear vendors live? Man, proper lubrication gear is vendors. a big thing. It's either, it either works or it doesn't work. You know, I mean, if, if it goes to slipping or something, it's done in no time. But I mean, I have one, I've, and it's Scott rode in my other car too with it. We run it 7,500, 8,000 RPM, click the gear van on and let it rip and never had a problem with it, you know. But some people, it doesn't take, I mean, they can break an anvil with a rubber hammer. It doesn't take much. A lot, a lot yeah, of that has to somebody... do with, with making sure it has good lubrication. You know, one of the big problems is is people don't follow the instructions that they tell you. Hey, you must do this. You must do that. You must put it in this way. It must have these specs and these tolerances. And some people just slap them on. Yep. There's there's a yeah, thing there's to be a, measured. You, you know? definitely got to measure and make everything fit. And so well, they uh, can they uh, can try to make Andy it for Neverland. everybody. Andy Sorry. Netherland wants to know. He's got a 3,300-pound, 1,400 rear-wheel horsepower turbo drag week car. Would a power glide or turbo 400 be uh, better for reliability? Reliability, it's a turbo car? Yeah, 1,400 rear-wheel horsepower drag week car. How much weight? 3,300 pounds. Well, I'm 3,215, and I've been beating the crap out of my power glide, and it's holding up great. And I, draw, yeah, I put I a lot of miles on it. I don't think you go wrong with a power glide. They make a shorty power glide kit with the gear vent is actually only three inches longer than a regular power glide. Yeah, the, the short gear vendors. Yep. Yeah, that's a very compact package and it makes it a hell of a lot easier. That, that's what I have in my drag week car. Uh, Jared, what I also Jared, learned. <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, Jared Hicks, you missed the part where we talked about you can't have too big of a cooler or cool enough transmission fluid he wants to know if in a race application if you have any issue looping the cooler lines and not running a trans cooler with a jw case power mm -hmm. light well yes it's called very hot fluid <laughs> yeah it'll be very very hot better have better than a 300 pound uh, 300 degree gauge yeah you'll go through a lot of parts real quick on that transmission with it being that hot all the time Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm, you know, this kind of goes back to the idea of having an aftermarket uh, case. You know, you're, you're just asking for trouble <laughs> with a situation like that. And, you know, we're all trying to save money and do this and that. But, you know, th th that never pays in the long run. Well, I mean, Earl, if they're driving uh, it to go the, ahead. dragging it to the starting line and just cranking and doing a burnout and making a pass, it's still going to get hot as hell. So having a cooler would definitely help. Any strategies that you recommend? You know, we've talked quite a bit about turbo cars and so forth, and obviously those are the ones where staging is kind of a critical thing. Uh, you know, how long are you on the trans brake? How long are you this? Are there things that you recommend your you know people driving the cars for trans that you've prepped that they do to make them live longer and still be able to deal with the turbo staging? 
man, it all comes with just lots of trial and error. And you de definitely want to kind of judge how the other guy stages. You don't want to just be out there, hung out there for 10 seconds on the trans break. I mean, that, that's going to do just tremendous damage. So obviously you know, watching the other person, you know, seeing if you can stage second, you know, pay. And I, I always, I'll race. go talk to them. Whoever I'm racing, I'll go talk to them and say, look, does your car spool up? Does it stage good? Whatever. I want to know. I mean, if it takes him five seconds to start to get it spooled up, I'm going to let him go in first or whatever. And that, cause I know mine just goes in and you deck it and it's on, it's on the two step. Jason Robertson, um, what temperatures are safe? I like to keep mine under 200 degrees, but I know, I know that in some drag race applications you're going to see 250. But the higher the temperature that it runs, the the better the fluid you're going to need. Exactly. I, typically on drag week, I see mine at 250 all week, but we try to keep it under there. You know, 250, 240, we we steady rolling. And we try to get it cooled down. If it gets around 290 or something, we'll slow it. We'll stop and let it cool off or whatever. But we try to keep it in the 250 range. I usually stop at 250. I try not to let mine be above about 220. Yeah, and I mean, if, it depends on what fluid you have, too. But, uh, I mean, ideally, if you can keep it at 170, it would be great, you know? Darce yeah, Laws wants to know if a glide is more reliable than a 400, why not do a glide in the gear vendors? Would that still be less money? 3,700 pounds and 2,000 horse drag application. I, I think know. glide is your most durable transmission you have. If you do it right and put like the turbo 400 output shaft and the big one and 360 input shaft and 10 clutch drum and Sonex planets, you can overbuild it, but you'll never tear it up. What about the fact that he just said 3,700 pounds, though? Is that pushing kind of where he needs to switch to a 400? You borderline right there, but look, even my little white car is 3,600 pounds with a right. 302 and a power glide, and it, it flies, you know? So Chase Griffiths, Chase Griff, Griffiths expounding on that wants to know, what's the point of going to a two-speed turbo 400 then? That's a waste of time. <laughs> and it costs more money. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, there seems to be a, a number of people that are going that route and, you know, people talk about strength. It's just hard. It's hard to know. And, you know, I, speaking for myself, I have no experience with doing that. I just went directly to the glide approach. But um, hey, hey, Bill. obviously some people are making money selling those. Yes, Mark. Am I allowed one one more one more coyote joke? Why not? Absolutely. Well, because because poor Bill Burning, he says he's been seeing more Turbo Four Hundreds behind Coyote Mustangs, the S Five Fifty chassis. How are they holding up? Well, the Turbo Four Hundred will take like two thousand, three thousand horsepower. So there isn't a Coyote on the planet that's going to hurt one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering now. Now you've got me wondering what they run in uh, Matusek's car. Oh, uh, you know, the, you know, I know I'm, <laughs> by the way, guys, I'm only joking. I really do know what they're capable of. I'm only joking. <laughs> I like to tease. No worry, Mark. We, we, we know. And, and anyway, um, so, um, Earl, we, we did say that we're, you know, we're, we're looking at kind of these traditional drag week style transmissions. If, if you're kind of looking at this with where the future seems to be headed, are some of these other more modern transmissions, are we going to start seeing more of those at some of these events? If we can keep them together, <laughs> that's the, that's the next thing. Because a lot of guys are running, uh, we're seeing a few more late model cars creeping in. Uh, thanks to Dodge sponsorship, we're seeing lots of Dodges at uh, at Drag Week, and obviously they're running their. Gosh, I think it's a seven-speed transmission. I'm not sure. Mm, that that's that's going to be a mess. Dodge is not the greatest on transmissions. Just wanted to hear you say that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so we, we talked about the glide you mentioned, uh, one of the pieces of advice I got from Rick at gear vendors is after each race, open up the, uh, the screw in the reservoir, 
take a little fluid out. If the fluid is changing color, change the fluid. I mean, the nice thing about a glide is they don't take much, or a glide, I mean, a gear vendors is they don't take much exactly. fluid. And I was using mine at a little bit after the thousand foot mark at a quarter mile track because uh, the car would pick up both ET and mile an hour, even though I could just get right by the, you know, the top of the rev limiter going through the lights, you know, in second. Uh, with the glide but it actually picked up both by using the gear vendors but that was Mm -hmm. his advice yeah maintenance people i can't get people they'll spend a hundred thousand dollars on a car but they won't maintenance you know they you tell them they got to change oils and fluids and stuff just like an engine oil filter they go run their fifty thousand dollar engine and never take the oil filter off and look at it every race i go to i take the oil filter off and look at it can highly recommend um, the clear view filtration filters for that reason also because you can see when yep. something goes wrong okay so i'm going to step in it here but i've run a system one for a long time because it's easy to inspect the yep. element on exactly. those same concept you can see same what you thing. can see i mean my system one i just take the cap off and pull the element out i mean if you look in the cap you can see right away if you got a bunch of metal shavings in it Yep, sadly had that happen too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'd rather catch it with a few metal shavings than it'd be full to the top. <laughs> yeah, it's an early warning system, just, just like we were talking about. I haven't had a chance to run one of those pretty full view ones, but those look nice. Yeah. Oh, it's, they're clear. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's well worth the money. It's a, lot better than, uh, it's a lot better to only have to take 10 off the crank than to have to replace the whole crank. Yeah. That makes good sense. I mean, it's you know, it's 100, 150 bucks to get them to clearance ten off if, for a, a cheaper uh, crankshaft place, and you know, new crank is thousand bucks. So take your choice. Same yeah, thing oh yeah, happens with transmissions. You either want to do it or not. I mean, <laughs> you can either replace a bunch of parts in the transmission, or you can see when it starts to make stuff and stop and pull it out, and only have to replace one little thing. Yep. So one of the other parts that you read about a lot these days are the roller bearing uh, tail shaft housings. Is that something that you recommend for transmissions? And again, it, is there a point at which you would make that recommendation, Earl? I mean, the roller bearing is a nice deal, but you got to make sure you put the matching yoke for it. You have to use a nitrated yoke. If you use a regular yoke, you'll just it'll start pitting and tearing it up. We put one of those in uh, in my transmission. Uh, I don't know what difference it makes, but it was a, hey, you're going to make power. You need a rollerized transmission to help parts out, make them live longer. Yep. It beats, it beats the hell out of a stock old 50-year-old tail housing, you know, with a, with a Babbitt bushing in it. So you, you mentioned uh, uh, yokes for a second. Um, what do you recommend, you know, for people, again, with yokes? I see a lot of people run around with kind of stock stuff. And do you automatically recommend that everybody go to at least 1350 U-joints along with that sort of change? Yeah, forged yokes and 1350 joints. And you have a lot, of, a lot more insurance than regular 1310 and 1330 joints and cast yokes and stuff. They break that. And when you, they don't realize when they break a dry shaft off, 90% of the time, they break the damn transmission off the, off the engine block. So it gets yeah. costly in a hurry. So in other words, once again, we're talking relatively inexpensive parts, which create a lot of insurance and save a lot of problems for people. So all y'all listen and out there. <laughs> and, and since we're talking about you if know, you're going to break a drive sure. shaft, put a, put a $60, $100 drive shaft loop in the car because that keeps the thing from slinging yep. around too much, which means there's less forces on the tail of the transmission, which means there's less yanking things around. If you can keep it, even if it breaks, at least if it stays in its place mostly, you're not slinging all that mass somewhere else to break other parts. Yep. And it's just basic safety then. Not to mention, you yeah, don't so want it coming through the floor either, just like you don't want parts of your transmission coming through the floor. <laughs> Yeah, we hate it when that happens. Um, speaking of which, when people are sizing, you know, most most of these cars, people are putting different parts in and everything is moved around. So you can't just assume drive shaft length. 
Uh, what's your method for making sure you've got the right length drive shaft in the car? Well, I'm not a drive shaft uh, technician, but I, I'll call like PST. They have a chart and they have lengths, critical speed lengths. So if, you're gonna, if you know you're going to turn the engine, say, 7,500 through the traps, you need a drive shaft that's good for 7,500. And it'll tell you what if you need a three inch, three and a half inch, four inch dry shaft. And it'll tell you the critical speed of it. So the best thing to do is get with somebody like PST or the dry shaft shop or something. And they can recommend the exact dry shaft you need. Don't just pick one out and say, I need this one. So I was thinking particularly about, you know, yoke depth, um, how much uh, there should be in terms of, you know, how far the yoke goes down onto the output shaft. Yeah. And, and I mean, if you're going to order like from PST or anybody like that for dry shaft, they give you specific dimensions measure from the seal and the power glide or the 400 to the center of the yoke on nine inch. Okay. Or 12 bolt. And they have everything. If you look online, their farm have every measurement you need. And if you do it like that, it'll come out dead on every time. It, it also needs to be measured with the vehicle sitting on the ground. So the yeah. suspension is loaded because as you drop the wheels down, when you lift the car off the ground, it pulls that yoke out of the transmission. And if you measure too long, now suddenly you're jamming against the back of that transmission and you'll break parts in the transmission. Yep. So at the other end of things, when we're talking about bolting the converter to the flex plate and then getting it, I, I think everybody has seen 101 things about how many clicks you need to make sure a converter is fully seated in the transmission. And you still can't get pump. it right, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Any tricks for that? Man. Spin and push and jiggle. It's, it's just a lot, of, a lot of working with it. But you need to do a measurement. If you, if if you, you think you have it in there, you do a measurement how far the flywheel is from the block and do your measurement from how far the converter is from the face of the transmission. And I mean, if the converter is only in a half inch and the flywheel sticks out three quarters of an inch from the block, it's not going to go together, partner. So don't put it up there and put an impact in it and bust it in place because you just bought a pump. If you can't push the transmission on the back of the engine by hand and spin the converter freely. Exactly. Stop. Yeah. I get guys, yep. they buzz the pump every freaking week. Well, we've they had put guys it in with the impact the, every time. Break the case because they put it on and it wasn't all the way in, and they tried to impact the case down onto the engine, and it just broke the case. Yep. Hey, two things they cannot do. I don't care how how many times you explain to them. Shim a converter and set the shift linkage on the transmission. So. So Why let's don't we take talk those about one at a time. <laughs> let's talk about shim and the converter. You know, how will they know they've got that right? We've just heard that you got to be able to get it on by hand and have it seat all the way against the block or the block plate and still spin the converter. How do they know they got the converter the right depth into the trans? Well, if it's converter's bottomed all the way out in the transmission, you don't want to pull it out more than an eighth of an inch. 125. I try to shoot for hundred thousands because if you pull it out too much, you don't have enough engagement in your pump gear. But if you pull it out a hundred thousands and put a washer between it and the flywheel, you're golden. And as for the shift linkage, everybody adjusts the shift in park. Who gives a damn if it's good in park? You need to make sure it's good in first, second, and third, where you're going to be 90% of the time. So you put the shift all the way in low. You put the transmission in low. Make sure the, 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 the little deal slides in and out the shift linkage. Put it in second. Make sure it slides in and out. Put it in third. You're not too much worried about reverse and park and neutral. You're never there. But first, second, and third, you're always in there. Yeah, the idea is that um, you want so that the idea is that you want your shift linkage on the transmission itself, the little lever, to sit in its resting position in those gears without any tension forwards or backwards. So exactly. that when you pop the, the shifter in there, it's exactly in the detent where it's supposed to be to fully engage everything in that transmission for that gear. What about, no power glide, what about power glide band adjustment, Earl? It it goes according to valve bodies, whoever's, you, which you, most of them are common, three and a half turns. You, you tighten it up 80 foot, 80 inch pounds, back it off three and a half rounds. And that, we typically do those every like 
50 runs or something like that, you'll adjust the band. Now, if it starts acting stupid and wanting to rock on the trans break and stuff, you might want to do it before that. But typically, they, they can go at least 40 to 50 runs before you need adjustment. Just to clarify, you said inch pounds or foot pounds? Because I know some people are going to hear it differently. No, no. Inch pounds. Inch, inch pounds. pounds. So I wanted to make sure that people hear that. Inch pounds, not foot pounds. <laughs> Don't grab your big torque wrench. It's the little tiny one with the little tiny measurements. Yeah, because foot pounds are going to need a new case. How many Ugga Duggas is an inch pound? Uh, <laughs> just a bump. Just half a Ugga Dugga. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. We're getting down to the precise measurements and all of that. Uh, do you have a preference with shifters to use with either glides or uh, turbo 400s or some of the other transmissions used for racing? Uh, the M and M shifter is a, it's a real nice shifter. Um, I like the TCI and the um, the Outlaw, the Outlaw TCI shifter. We have that in a few, quite a few cars. Yeah, and everybody it's real has positive shifting. You you got to remember that everybody has different things that they do with their shifters. So the way the gate works, it has to feel comfortable to you. It's, some of it is personal preference. You know, if you grab, a, if you sit in somebody's car and you push their shifter around, and you don't like how it feels. It's probably not the shifter for you. Try and see if there's another one that you like. There, the a lot of the higher dollar ones do a great job. They're all fairly similar. They all accomplish the same thing: move it from gear to gear. But it has to be comfortable to you, and that's important because when you're racing, if you can't get your hands on the thing and shift it to the next gear, you can't win a race. Exactly. Watching some of the TV shows, I've seen a few people that, you know, famous street outlaw guys who seem to have shifters that are barely attached to the car. That makes me crazy. Does it, is, is that a problem or is it just me? <laughs> well, as long as the detent works on the shifter and everything's right, it's not a big problem, but it's only I, a problem when you wreck the car it. and it comes loose and swings around and hits you in the head. It's more mm, of a safety issue than a transmission problem. And another thing, make sure the shifter cable is mounted to the transmission, not to the body of the car. Yep. Everything flexes. It's not going to be the same. I fought that already with a guy. He kept saying every time he left, the trans brake, let the trans brake go, it would shift the second by itself. I said, it's impossible. It's a manual valve body. Can't do that. Well, after he brought the car and started looking at it, he had the cable mounted to the damn body. So Is this a guy with a large plate? It, <laughs> yeah, no once you launch it, the engine, the engine would move and it would shift it. I love that. <laughs> I've made a million mistakes. I haven't made that one, thank God, but <laughs> lots of other ones. Although I've heard of other people having mystery shift issues, especially when they go to a block plate or block plate mid plate, and they don't have anything yep. that locates the engine and transmission longitudinally in the car, and everything just moves around. Mystery problems. Earl, what have we missed? I, I know you've got uh, a family obligation coming up pretty quick here. What, what is something we've, we've gone through a lot of questions. And for those of you that we had the late thing, you, you'll be able to hear on the rebroadcast what the early questions were. Uh, what have we missed here? What, what are the things that you see most when people bring in transmissions and they're having problems? What, what is it you see the most of? Well, I'm sure Scott can answer that. He's seen all the the, the problems we had come in over the years he was here so yeah there's... oh you mean with scott's car <laughs> no with, with everybody's car um well, well i gotta get off here fellas i gotta go to school pick up my daughter earl thank you very much for being on tonight we appreciate all the insight and the expertise uh we look forward to having you on down the road ways and we look forward to oh, seeing yeah. you at the next drag week thanks oh, we'll definitely be there it was nice to all meet right. you all right bro. see y'all later take Bye. care so, um, you were saying, Scott? You were well. You were asking about other problems that we've seen, and you know, a lot of a lot of things we see is people don't check their fluid after they fill up a transmission, right? And so they don't have enough fluid in it. We've had numerous amounts of people come in and going, "Oh man, the thing it just shifts lazy. It doesn't shift right." And we get to looking at it, and we realize that they're you know a quart and a half low or something. They they filled it up and they checked the dipstick, but they checked the dipstick in park 
or they check it and, you know, they haven't put it through the gears and, and actually checked it again after they've done it. So one of the common things that I'll do is I'll, I'll fill it up and then I'll start the car up and let it run for a second and then I'll shift into first and then I'll shift into second and I'll push it through each gear so that it, the fluid can get through the valve body because all that empty space has to burp out any air that's in there and it needs to clear all that before you can know exactly how much fluid you, you have. When you switch to the next gear, it keeps fluid in those passages. So you can there's quite a bit of space in there. So you go through it all and then you check it and you look at it and then shut the car off and let it sit and let the converter drain back into it for a little bit. Then start it up again, run it, push it through the gears again, and then look at it again because now you're you're getting burping air out of the converter as well and burping out of other places. So people just pour in fluid, oh yeah, it looks good, and they start driving and then they're low on fluid and they burn up the transmission really quick. So that's one of the more common things that, I, that we saw with people bringing stuff in. We have uh, to touch on uh, shifter adjustments. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. To touch on uh, one with the um, the 6L80 stuff, uh, fluid, fluid level is a big one. Uh, I got my little one screaming at me. <laughs> um, run those things a quart over full. Yeah, uh, especially absolutely. if you're racing. Uh, that's a big common issue with the 6L80, 6L90 stuff. Um, you know, guys will have a, an instance where the thing won't shift right at, you know, high RPM. And, you know, it's it's because it's starving of fluid. So Yeah, the hard part with those is actually filling it to that extra quart just because it fills from the underside while the engine's running, while the pump's gone. It's a, it's a weird thing to fill. And you got to use a, a squeeze bottle or a pump with pressure to push it up in there. So it's a little yeah, weird. To yeah, feel you're it. right. Uh, and the, then you got to be quick about getting the thing on. To, you know, run it through all the gears and you know get it to its uh, you know resting level because you know it obviously has to be up to temperature and, and all that stuff too for the GM side of it. And then once you get everything you know to the level of GM, uh, basically dump another full cord into it. That's what we. That's how we do it. The the other thing that we found is, you know, people have this problem with, we, we all agree that it's really, really dumb to just start your car and immediately rip on it and run as hard as you can because you don't have any fluids up to temperature. While you can't truly have the fluids too cool, there's still a point where you still need to have the fluids moving and the, and the materials inside the transmission need to have some temperature in them before you beat on it. You know, it's while the fluid is going to remain reasonably cold, there's still got to be some temperature there. You know, you don't want it... Uh, negative 20 degrees out and you're beating on it with a fresh crank just like you wouldn't want to do that on your on your engine either you know there's there's something to be said about getting at least some heat in the fluid before you start beating on it all right good advice james anything else that you've seen with a lot of the newer transmissions because you do a lot of work on the hp tuner stuff and the, and the stock ecus which will tend to be cars that have those other things that uh, people tend to miss that cause problems? Uh, not really. I mean, the, the biggest problem is uh, getting cards in that have already been modded prior and somebody's already jacked the tune up and baked the clutches in the transmission and having to try to band-aid a mechanical issue, you know, with tuning only. And, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, those things are really easy to burn up. So it's, it's really meticulous to keep, uh, fluid in the transmission for one, you know, the cord overfill deal, especially with torque converters and, you know, cars that are making a little bit more power. Uh, and then obviously, you know, making sure the thing isn't slipping because the tune's jacked up. So, uh, Hey, Scott, uh, while we've got a break here, it doesn't sound like we have any more questions that have been posted up yet. Do you want to sure. talk a little bit about this class schedule? Sure. So coming up here, you want to learn how to tune stuff? Uh, we got some classes for you. We've got a couple of different classes happening all across, across the country. Uh, you can see them on the Real Tuners website as well. So you can just go there and click on it. Um, we've got, uh, I think, starting in January, the first class is uh, Mopar Dodge Factory ECU tuning with Rick Tapp from Trick Pro Motorsports. Um, I know we have. Uh, also in January, I think we got a uh, Busher Racing in Norwalk, Ohio. We got a standalone EFI class, um, January 20, 19th and 20th there. Uh, in February, I know we have 
Um, here in Vegas, we have Revolution Street Cars here in Las Vegas, February 23rd and 24th. We're doing a standalone EFI class. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here in moving up through the months? Uh, March, Dynocom Industries, Fort Worth, Texas, Real Tuners Advanced Holly EFI One Day Class. This is a, a special short class for advanced stuff. Uh, you've already been through the basics. You need a little more. You want to know uh, a few more of the fancy tricks in the ECU? That's the class to go to. Uh, once again, March 2nd in Fort Worth. Uh, looks like April, there's one coming up out in Springfield. Uh, that's a, a two-day advanced class, April 27th, 28th. Um, and I think we got April 13th, 14th, the level one class in, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So, uh, hopefully it's warmed up up there and there's no more snow on the ground by the time that class hits. I know it's cold up there sometimes. Um, I think that gets us through April. And then I know we've got some in May and also another one in May in Springfield. And then, uh, it looks like June, there's an advanced class as well for uh, all those guys up there in Milwaukee who took take the level one class. You want to go to the advanced? Uh, that We got one uh, June 15th and 16th. So I think that covers most of the ones I see on the schedule right now. Tell your friends, tell your cool. family. Yep. Discounts for tell small phone. groups of people. Yeah, and let's talk about the Las Vegas one for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Las Vegas one is going to be a uh, basic standalone EFI. Um, we cover all the stuff that, that works on probably 95% of the ECUs that you can put on your car. Uh, I'm sure there will be things that it doesn't cover, but we cover most of the ones that you want. Um, we talk about uh, the basics of installation, configuring it before you uh, fire it up the first time. We talk about uh, some, some basic wiring things that you need to know. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the importance of syncing the crank timing and uh, making sure that everything is right before you uh, start beating on it. Um, we'll talk about power tuning, um, a whole bunch of other topics. Uh, there's a dyno there, so it's up at Revolution Street Cars, which is the, the north end of town near the drag strip. Uh, it's literally like a half mile from the drag strip on the same uh, inbound road towards the drag strip once you get up there. And, uh, yeah, February 23rd, 24th, that's usually when it starts warming up again out here. I mean, it's not really cold, but we're, uh, we're the chilly part of the year right now. And, uh, there's, it starts, starts warming there's up. There's going about to be then. a, there's a good possibility. There's going to be more, uh, real tuners people at that event than any other yeah. one altogether. So, it sounds like several of us, uh, myself, I'll be there because I live out here. I'm sure that several other people will, uh, show up as well. Uh, I think Bewley was talking about coming out, and uh, maybe you were talking about coming out, Mark, maybe? I'd, I'd like to. It, it depends on how things shake down, but I'd really like to go to that one. Yeah, there's a, it'll, it's going to be a great class, I'm sure. Uh, we'll have plenty of people who can uh, chime in on topics when you have questions, for sure. Okay. Yeah, other than going out to dinner, I'm looking forward to uh, going there. The, the, that's about what I can add to the the benefit is uh, <laughs> ordering food, but yeah. uh, that can be fun too. Uh, Mark, any other questions or anything we need to get to before we wrap up? There's a there's a couple of follow up questions on some stuff, but uh, uh, someone wanted to know if there was a uh, aftermarket pilot tube to help run a cord over on the transmission, um, and then. Uh, Go ahead. So all I've ever done with that is you just got to use a pump and push it up in there because the it's literally like an open bung tube in there that it just kind of overflows into it. I mean, you could probably take the pan off and modify that to stick up further. But I've always just used a pump and you just pump an extra cord and in then, there because it, it'll then do, keep and then going. just get the plug in. Yeah, and just it'll drip out a little bit, but just hurry up and get the plug in. That's make a little bit of a mess, but that's all I've ever done. I mean, it's going to make a little bit anyways because it's usually you fill them up until it starts running back out, and then you let it settle, and then you put the plug in. It doesn't drain so fast that you can't put more in. I mean, it's a pretty small hole. Daniel Brummett wants to know if the podcast will be every Wednesday still. Uh, that is our plan. However, we've got Christmas and New Year's messing with the schedule, so we're probably going to take a couple of weeks off. Um, for sure, for sure but, next uh, week because it's uh, definitely yeah, Christmas. For sure and... Yeah, for sure next week. 
Yeah, and if we decide that we'll be back around just after New Year's, we'll let everybody know well in advance. But at the moment, it looks like the plan is to give a two-week break, and we'll have the best of real tuners uh, up for people to listen to who want to do that. Uh, or I might just play holiday music. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Baby, it's cold <laughs> outside? Yeah, Baby, Absolutely. it's cold outside. It's my favorite song. You know, uh, all, the, uh, all, all the different versions that there are as, as best we possibly can. That would be perfect. All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to episode, gosh, what was this, 68? 69? Uh, I thought we were sure. 70, maybe? I don't know. Maybe uh, 70, we, yeah. Let's, let's so see. We, anyway, can, we can find that out. We're looking forward to a heck of a new year. Lots of classes, lots of great podcasts coming up. Uh, we're going to be alternating Q&As because we hear a lot of good feedback around the Q&A, so we'll be continuing to focus on that. And don't be afraid to post Q&A questions on Real Tuners fan page ahead of time so we can make sure we get those questions or bring in some experts to answer those. So post your questions. Keep that active. We look at it all the time and we'll answer online, but we'll also queue some up for the podcast in the future. So uh, with it, Scott, will you take us out? 